uh, it, it is so deeply painful to to hear some of the helplines share that they might have hour long waiting lists, like when, when you call with suicidal thoughts. It has the potential to be a real game changer, in my humble opinion, and to really impact thousands and millions of lives across the world. But like you're, you're talking about the elephant in the room about like, is any of this technology going to replace anyone? Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Mental Wellbeing Show. Today, we are joined by Dr. Tim Altoff to discuss all things AI and mental health. Tim is an assistant professor in computer science at the University of Washington, and he directs the Behavioral Data Science Group, where he and colleagues aim to extract and analyze data to improve the health, happiness, and lives of everyday individuals. Tim has published in some of the top data science journals, including Nature Communications and Nature Machine Intelligence. And in today's episode, Tim and I discuss why AI could be the next game changer in mental health, whether the future of your therapy sessions lies in talking to machines, whether therapists, psychologists, and psychiatrists are likely to be replaced by machines in the future, the risks involved in using AI in mental health and much, much more. If today's episode brings you value or if any of the other episodes have brought you value in your life, I'll be so grateful if you subscribe to the Mental Wellbeing Show as this is how I continue to grow the show and communicate evidence-based psychology and mental wellbeing strategies out to the broader community. Thanks for tuning in and now to today's discussion on AI in mental health with Dr. Tim Altoff. Welcome to the Mental Wellbeing Show, where we take a deep dive into the wonderful worlds of psychology and mental wellbeing. Each episode, we dive into the evidence with a global subject expert and break down the science into applicable strategies so you can take steps to improving your mental wellbeing. Dr. Tim Altoff, welcome to the Mental Wellbeing Show. Thank you for having me. It's fantastic to have you on, Tim. This has been a really interesting experience to research through your work to dive into a bit of AI, uh, an area that as a psychologist, I'm not very familiar with at all. So it's been interesting already, and I'm very much looking forward to learning of you for the next hour or so as well. And in terms of areas of differing expertise, how does an assistant professor in computer science go about getting into areas of mental health, psychotherapy and empathy and the like. Yeah, it, it's it's not necessarily the usual thing. And I, I imagine I, I, I know more about AI than psychology, but I'm also very excited uh, to learn more about uh, psychology um, every day and on this podcast. How I first got into it was honestly, mostly by accident. I started graduate school working towards a PhD in computer science um, at Stanford now, um, maybe almost 10, 10 years ago. And very early in that program, as I was trying to figure out what to work on, I, I, I learned I was really interested in people and how computing can help us better understand and empower people. But the connection to mental health was made during kind of one event on campus where a crisis hotline was visiting campus to talk about different considerations about the, the data they were collecting and how to get the most value out of um, and, and how to uh, improve services while being mindful of, of privacy and, and ethics considerations. They basically asked, we think there's value in this data, but we need somebody to kind of go get it out of the data. And I happened to be the only computer scientist uh, in, in the room at the time. And I, I, I had the privilege of, of just raising my arm and, and, and share my excitement uh, to take a stab at it. And that led to the the very first project in that space for us. Why is there even a, a need for AI to be involved in an area like mental health? The way I see it, but like one of the big challenges is men in mental health is just the barriers and, and limited access. We have a billion people affected by mental health conditions worldwide. Whenever I, I, I hear new statistics about mental health, they're always shocking in where most people do not have access to kind of the necessary treatment, even when that's necessary, even when they're seeking it out, even if, if they live in a very well-resourced country still there's so limited access uh, to mental health care. So completely independent of AI, this just seems like a space where we need to consider kind of any and all possible solutions, give people access to the care that they need. And I, I see AI technology as, as one potential tool that can help with that. Now that we've worked uh, for many years in this space, I, I really think that AI technology could help in this space 
At the same time, from a mental health perspective, I think it's really just a being willing to to consider any possible solution to pro provide better care to people. Such an important point in terms of access to care, because that's kind of supply demand gap is is widening, whereby the demand for mental health services is only increasing. You look at rates of psychological distress, mental illness only going up and up and up. And more psychologists, more psychiatrists, more mental health nurses isn't really the, or certainly not the one solution to that because the horse is already bolted. The, the, the gap between mental health professionals and the need for it is already so wide. And my, my colleagues in clinical psychologists tell me not only do we not, not have enough people to take care of everybody, we also don't have the capacity to train more people so that any time in the near future, we would have enough people. The gap is just kind of so big and widening that, that really it will take kind of some new solutions, some innovation to really help help bridge that gap and, and, and really get into people's uh, kind of so many people are, are suffering without access to care. My hope is that AI technology can play a role in that and, and help bridge that gap and, and help people gain access to the care that they need. And I mean, this is even in America, where you are in Australia, the, the demand for mental health services is huge. But even in low income countries, it's, you know, the amount of mental health practitioners there is abysmally small. You know, I think in, in some countries in Africa, for example, it's two mental health practitioners per 100,000 people. Certainly more scalable interventions like AI, I think, uh, have a huge, huge, huge potential. And we've already seen that, right, with the uptake of digital mental health and, and apps and things like that. People are already, you know, uh, taking on those to look after their mental health. Absolutely. And, and if the traditional psychotherapy model is we talk once a week for an hour, there's just like such a, a natural limitation towards how many people you can help as a single person. I think you're right. The using AI technology in mental health really is just a natural extension of work that's been going on for, for a long time in digital mental health has been working on giving access to mental health tools as well. And in many ways, a lot of our work actually focuses on kind of as a computer scientist, it's really important that I don't reinvent the wheel. I'm not a clinical psychologist. Like this is, this is not my place, uh, to, to, to innovate. And a lot of our work is, is really to look at existing interventions, including uh, existing digital interventions, and to just see where can we better support people through AI technology. And I think that brings a point about human AI collaboration, which I know you're kind of big on collaboration between the AI and uh, existing practitioners. And I want to dive into some of those interventions in a second. But before I do, Tim, I want to share with you my experience of researching through this and my experience of when I first heard that AI is coming into mental health, my initial thoughts were no way therapy as, as a psychologist, therapy is such a human endeavor. You know, you've got one person sharing their utmost fears and desires and insecurities and hopes. There's no way they're going to do that to a machine, to a robot. And I actually came across a, this was an interview with a, a bunch of psychiatrists. And one of the psychiatrists interviewed said this about his thoughts on AI in, in therapy. And he said, a robot is incapable of being empathetic in a caring relationship. I think that summed up my initial thoughts. Is, is that How did you feel when you first heard about AI moving into this area? I have to chuckle because on the one hand, I've spent years and years figuring out how computers can measure and express empathy. At the same time, I might even agree with that person that the computers are, are not the ones necessarily expressing empathy. Uh, it, it's not that kind of the machine in front of you is kind of capable of this kind of human understanding of, of the situation you're in, the, the emotions that you're experiencing. And I'm sure we'll get into more of, of that work on empathy. What I found is that computers can help us express empathy better. The empathy is still being expressed by a human being that is trying to express empathy, but what the machine really is helping with is helping that person find the right words to express empathy more effectively. Actually, pretty often our, our work is possibly misunderstood in, in the sense that now computers have human empathy and it's just the same. I, I, I really don't think it is. What these machines and the AI technologies is really good for helping you find the right words. There's just so many ways of expressing something. Maybe you haven't come across it, um, expressing, say, empathy to a, a, a vulnerable friend or client is really, really difficult. It's, it's hard to find the right words in, in a situation. 
But if you've seen millions of such situations, you might be able to help the people involved find the right words to express what they want to express to the other person. That's such a, a nuanced and interesting point because, yeah, it is a very tough skill to be genuinely empathetic and to hear that AI can potentially help people express that, I think, is a very pertinent point. And this, encaps this is encapsulated in one of your interventions, the Haley intervention, which is pretty much the first thing that I read on your work and how I came across your work, Tim. And this, this really changed my perception of AI and mental health. Take us through yeah, a little bit about the nuts and bolts of of Haley. Uh, and I, I hope it, it changed your perspective for the better. Oh, uh, definitely. Uh, <laughs> tell me afterwards. Uh, <laughs> this Haley system is a system that uses language model technology, things that we call reinforcement learning, in order to help people express empathy better. And really how we can imagine this is kind of like a, uh, like a Grammarly or, or Microsoft Word kind of autocorrect or, or kind of giving you suggestions for how you might express empathy better. The work on Haley started much before we actually kind of did the final study testing out Haley, but it started with even just thinking about what are the most important uh, skills for mental health practitioners to have to really effectively support someone else. And we were interested in that, especially coming from a peer support context, where we were working with a very large online peer support platform that had millions of amazing people that kind of came there to share their own suffering to, to receive, but also to give support. But the point with peer support is that none of many of them, and typically most of them haven't been trained like a mental health professional to deliver effective support. Those platforms, we started talking about the, the issues around mental health care access. We've seen millions and millions of people go to these peer support platforms, sometimes to complement other forms of care. But for many, it's really the only form of care that they have access to. The people we worked with had a, had a kind of a, a strong sense that the kind of the people on these platforms are amazing, but the support could be so much more effective if they were trained in certain best practices. And then when we thought about what are some of the, the first basic skills that I know you might teach in a, I don't know, psychotherapy or counseling one-on-one -on -one lecture, this might be something like empathy. And it's this centering enabling factor that has been correlated with symptom improvement, has been associated with kind of the formation of alliance and rapport and the formation of, of kind of effective relationships. So we felt this was a good place to start for us. This was four or five years ago now. And we started actually much short of giving people feedback on empathy. We just wanted to make sure to even understand what is empathy and, and how do we measure it? How would a machine actually measure that? And you actually found that by Haley giving suggestions to these peer supporters that they actually were able to give more empathic responses to people in need of mental health care than they otherwise would without that second perspective from the Haley intervention. Uh, that's exactly right. So we had the privilege of working with 300 peer supporters from this um, online platform, a really amazing platform with amazing people behind it called Talk Life. So we worked um, with 300 peer supporters and then half of them we put in a control group that were basically doing peer support where you don't get feedback on what you're writing. You just press submit and it, it goes out to the other person. And then a treatment group that had access to our AI tool that would give you feedback on how to express empathy better whenever you wanted that. Like one important part for us in, in designing this technology was to still keep the agency with a peer supporter. So the feedback is there whenever you want to and, and, and only then. What you said is exactly right. We found that when people had access to the feedback, the AI feedback, they were making use of it and they expressed more empathy as a result. One really interesting kind of detail in this study that I think really emphasizes the how much potential there is with this AI support is that for all these 300 peer supporters, just before the study really started and they started responding to people, we actually trained everybody using traditional methods on empathy say, kind of working through a couple of pages in a book, understanding what empathy is, what the mechanisms are, examples for that. The difference that we saw between this treatment group and this control group didn't only mean that there was some value to this AI feedback, but it actually meant that even beyond traditional training methods that are kind of static and, and usually somewhat generic examples that are not personalized to this very specific context you find yourself in right now, kind of everybody in the control group had just been trained on empathy. And, and we know from our work and, and other work that 
typically people don't get better in empathy over time. They actually kind of express less and less empathy over time, if anything. Everybody was trained on empathy just to begin with, but still, we still found a, a very significant um, increase in how much empathy was being expressed when people had access to AI feedback, really on top of traditional means of training that this personalization, this kind of just-in-time feedback was really helping people um, e express empathy. In terms of personalization, I think one of the examples that I read through from the Haley intervention in terms of providing a more empathic response to the peer supporter was help seeker reached out and there was an issue to do with their job, their work context. The initial response was, don't worry. Whereas Haley suggested something more personalized, like you said, which is it must be a huge struggle. I'm there for you. What would it be like to talk to your boss? And this is a sidebar. Don't worry is some of the worst advice you can give to someone who is worrying. It's just to pretty much sending the message that you can switch off your worry by just not worrying. I think that really gives an example, though, of how personalized it is, how much you can improve empathic responding of people. Absolutely. And I, I'm very grateful. I, I've learned so much by, by working in this space. I didn't know that much about empathy. Uh, when we started this, but early on, I, I was taught that don't worry is this kind of classic red flag. Clearly, the person is al already worrying. It can easily come across invalidating. I'm sure I've said this in the past. I'm sure a lot of other people have said this oh, in the too. past. I, I think so many of us can really benefit um, from this feedback. And, and as you said, our AI system actually recognized that this don't worry might not be the best idea. And instead saying it must be a real struggle was actually validating that person's uh, experience, uh, them worrying. So it, it really kind of suggested to the opposite of that. With Haley, right, this is a bit more of i I'm going to butcher the terminology here from an AI point of view, but this is a bit more about like classifying responses um, and then improving them based on kind of data that's fed in. But I am curious, how would these interventions go in a more open setting. When I say open setting, I mean like when I'm in a therapy session with a client, it's not, the responses I say aren't really easily classified. I don't say, okay, I'm going to give an empathic response here, then, you know, a cognitive reframe here. It's more just fluid and dynamic. Like the first thing I'll often say is just, how was your week? I'm curious as to how these kind of uh, AI interventions would go in terms of these more open, fluid, less structured conversations? You know, how would an AI respond when a client says, my week was great, how was yours, thanks, for example? Yeah, in, in, in many ways, we don't know. Um, one, one very intentional step we made in defining this research program was to focus on more narrow, more closed situations, specific interventions. We felt this actually was really important, one, to actually provide, really be able to provide value. Who knows whether the AI would actually be helpful enough to truly be helpful rather than just being I know, disruptive of uh, two individuals having a, a meaningful uh, conversation. Or we would focus on specific interventions or often kind of specific worksheets that you might work with with the clients and how we can bring those to life, what's hard for people and, and how can we support that. Um, at the same time, I, I think as these technologies get better, they will more and more come into this space of open-ended conversation as well. For instance, some people consider this co-pilot model where as a mental health professional, you might have this AI system that either after the session or in real time gives you feedback on, on how to best conduct the session with, with your client. I, I think it's, it's, it's important to ask the, the question you asked because we really don't know and so many things will be different. For instance, the empathy piece that we um, studied, we, we studied a peer support system that um, listeners could imagine basically a, a social media platform that really looks like any other social media platform they've seen just intended for mental health support. So what often happens on these platforms are these very quick, short conversations where you put yourselves out there, other people will reply to you. And, and very often those interactions are pretty short. And we okay. felt for these short conversations, a good thing to start with is to start with empathy to kind of establish, kind of help establish a relationship. And we actually saw that this seemed to be working as well. So when, when people, if you responded to me with empathy on this platform, I would be 70% or so more likely to actually follow you in the social media sense of following you. So, so we actually saw the downstream effects of empathy and that good things were happening and things that make so much sense from a psychology perspective 
that this would lead to better relationship formation. This was really the scenario where we just have this quick interaction. We likely don't know each other and we need to establish this. Whereas if you've been working with a client for months, maybe years, it's a very different relationship that you already have with the client. So I think a lot would change about how we think about empathy, how we express it. And there might even be not as much need. If you and the client have a really good working relationship, there's kind of a, a clear sense of trust. Not every word that you say to your client has to be empathic. Like there's mm -hmm. uh, in, in, in many ways, the empathy might be there to, to establish a relationship, an effective relationship to then work through other stuff by talking through other things. So I, I absolutely believe as you get into these longer term conversations, different contexts in a more open ended uh, context that the needs for AI systems would really differ it and uh, get a lot larger as well. This speaks to, I suppose, how AI can have different benefits at different parts of the therapy process rather than just coming in and replacing a therapist altogether. I suppose in terms of you know skills, you know, we talked a lot about empathy and, and trust and, and building that relationship, but also a bit more of a, a technical skill that you guys have really done a lot of work on is something called cognitive restructuring, which is this idea of reframing thoughts to be more rational or, or more helpful. Can you talk us through some of your work there? Because it, that seems very uh, interesting. And you've even got like an applied tool that people can, can readily go and use. Yeah, absolutely. I just mentioned that we often would look to common activities in, in a therapy process, kind of key skills that clients can develop that will then help them down the line. In the world of cognitive behavioral therapy, kind of the thoughts that people have are really important. And you will know so much more about cognitive reframing than I do. But we learned that this is kind of a well-established, effective intervention that when you can learn to do that that can, that, that can be so helpful to you. But we also found that this is so hard for people to do. Like it's uh, cognitively challenging. It might be emotionally triggering. It's really hard to overcome these difficult thoughts in, in the moment. If you're lucky enough to work with a mental health professional, they will be amazing and kind of teach you those skills and help you through it. But for so many people, they don't have access to one or in between sessions, they, they might want to practice the skill. They were sent home with a sheet of paper for their thought record and, and to kind of go through this exercise together. Uh, but we found that this is just really hard for people to do. And, and you could also see that in the data. For instance, we analyzed digital mental health tools that teach cognitive restructuring. And you will see kind of big kind of drops in engagement and in completion rates because it's so hard. Like when this thought is automatic and entrenched, maybe for quite a while, it's really hard to come up with any alt alternative perspective in that moment. So we identified kind of where things were really hard for people and kind of a, a barrier to effectively applying and learning the skill. And then we set out to develop AI systems that can actually help you through that process. Kind of the, the key things that they would do, it very much followed uh, kind of classic CBT-like worksheets where people would share a thought, a uh, negative thought that they recently had a situation in which that thought came up. Also actually really helpful for the AI system to learn a bit more about the person, contextualize in, in which context this thought came up. There's kind of the AI, for the AI system to be helpful, it, it needs to know enough about you to mm. um, have the chance of saying anything useful, something that mm. you would likely be able to relate to. Then what the AI system would, would do is it would actually help you figure out what type of, we call it thinking trap or cognitive mm -hmm. distortions might be going on in your thinking. So in, instead of having to learn about the 20 or so, depending on who we ask, cognitive distortions, many of which I know see maybe a bit overlapping, it's kind of hard for people to learn how to kind of detect them right and what the boundaries are. Or like That's a lot to ask for somebody who's experiencing a very negative thought right now. And where the AI tool can come in is it can look at your thoughts and give you suggestions, like maybe what's going on right now, your mind reading, or this is overgeneralization. And then we can teach you about overgeneralization. And that's the only thing you need to know. All the other mm. things, maybe you can learn later, but what's really immediately helpful uh, for you right now are the identifying the type of, of thinking patterns that are going on for you right now. Most important step where the AI come in is after that, we want to challenge this, this cognitive distortion. And what our system would do is it actually generates potential starting points. Uh, we would show everybody the AI system would generate a, ref a potential reframe for your thought in order to make sure that everybody using this tool 
would be able to relate to at least one of them because people are in different situations. They might have you know, different resources available to them. So it's really easy to I don't know, suggest a reframe that you can't relate to that's not helpful to you at all. Put a lot of work in, in training our system to provide helpful reframes, but also mm. show you multiple in the hope that there's kind of one starting point that will make it help, will help you in kicking off this, this process of considering alternative perspectives on, um, on your situation and on, on your thinking patterns. I love this concept because a lot of what happens in therapy, the magic that happens, so to speak, actually occurs in between sessions. And I can see, you know, this very concept, you know, being used by clients to, like you said, help them practice that skill of reframing because you, know, you see someone for an hour, you don't see them for another one, two weeks. Well, the distress is going to be there in between sessions. So having this skill as a way to almost talk to your therapist and practice that reframing when you're having distressing thoughts, I think is going to be extremely valuable. And has this tool been tested clinically with clients, you know, going through stress, anxiety, etc., or is it still kind of in the training process? This tool was co-developed by our university group uh, at the University of Washington and a mental health advocacy organization in the United States uh, called Mental Health America. We actually co-developed this tool from the ground up and it's actually deployed today. Anybody who wants to access it and this Mental Health America organization share a lot of kind of what they call DIY tools, self-guided interventions, as well as psychoeducation content. They actually have more than 10 million people a year of real people with real problems, many of which would kind of score highly on PHQ-9s and GAT-7s mm -hmm. and, and so on. They're the people that kind of use this website and we deployed it on this platform in kind of not a traditional healthcare setting, but really a, a, a clinical setting where people with mental health concerns could use this tool uh, to learn this skill. We've evaluated in lots of ways. Uh, we've written kind of several research publications about it. And to date, over 100,000 people actually have already used this tool. And that has also been really helpful because many people give us feedback that we can then integrate in, into improving this tool over time. I think I'll definitely link that in the, the show notes. And of course, you know, a disclaimer for people who are going through distress of, or mental illnesses of any sort is to seek professional help in conjunction with um, any tools or digital or digital uh, technologies that you're using. But certainly, I think it has a lot of potential. So I'll link it in the show notes for individuals who want to check it out. Now, in terms of limitations of these and risks of these interventions, what are some of the risks associated with AI in mental health that we're currently seeing? Many of the listeners might have heard about all the recent craze about AI and chatbots and things like ChatGPT and, and GPT-4. This is the exact technology that's underlying a lot of this mental health kind of technology as well. And one mm -hmm. really important thing to realize is as of today, there's no way of kind of guaranteeing that certain outputs will not happen. And especially from a safety perspective, this is really important where many of these models are trained from about any data that they can find on the internet, kind of, mm -hmm. which includes interactions that maybe we would not want to mimic or, or replicate. Making sure that these systems are safe for people to use, that they not generate any unsafe content uh, is, is a really important aspect in this work and something that we've been developing for years kind of alongside us developing these interventions is also kind of different safety mechanisms of kind of different automated classifiers that look for kind of certain language usage and increasingly kind of thinking about where to take the, the risk. So clearly in this mental health context, this is about the highest stake context that I could imagine AI coming in. There's so many more benign usages like help you make a restaurant reservation or, or book your next travel or whatever it might be. And clearly, there's not only opportunities, but also risks in introducing any technology, including AI technology in mental health. With that comes responsibility. One thing that we've been doing in this work is that we follow established um, ethics, principle-based ethics frameworks to help us understand what the risks might be and how to navigate them. And a little earlier on this podcast, we talked about how we actually intentionally chose this focused scope that we would only give empathy feedback in this context of one platform for peer supporters, or that the only thing we would do is 
to help you reframe negative thoughts. And clearly, mental health professionals do so many other things. But we intentionally chose this focus scope to be able to have a more controlled setting, to not try to do everything, uh, perhaps have kind of either a low quality and, and lack of effectiveness or even worse, kind of any unsafe generations come come through and, and actually being presented to a person. So we intentionally focused on these more narrowly scoped, well understood evidence based interventions that are also better understood from a from a benefit and risk perspective. And then we would combine those with uh, different safety reviews. So we would have different teams of computer scientists and mental health professionals, in, in some sense, trying to break the tools to try to see, could you ever get it to generate anything potentially harmful and then to improve our systems to make sure that that doesn't happen. But as I said earlier, as of today, there's no technology in, in the space that actually guarantees that something absolutely couldn't mm. happen, at least for, for many of the kind of large language models that are really trained on so much data that we we're not even entirely sure what's going into it. We also do is you brought up human AI collaboration uh, before. Mm. One thing yeah. we do is we also allow people to filter certain content or, or flag certain content so that uh, these kind of safety features and, and content kind of moderation features would evolve uh, alongside these uh, AI-supported interventions. I mean, it's so important what you brought up about the consequences here are greater than perhaps in any other field, given that you're dealing with people often who are suicidal, people who may have homicidal ideations as well. And, you know, as I understand it, these machines infallible, right? The, the risk of a false negative, the risk of deeming someone to not be suicidal, who is suicidal, is there. And all it takes potentially is one false negative and you've lost a person. But also, you know, the repercussions for companies implementing this, I can imagine, are, are huge as well. If, if someone goes out and and ends their life and this wasn't picked up on by the machine or has a some homicidal ideation to kill someone. And again, we as psychologists have duty to inform relevant people. It wasn't picked up by the machine. The consequences are dire potentially. Absolutely. And just to be entirely clear, none of the tools we developed were designed to be kind of used in a context with people with kind of suicidal thoughts. Uh, they also explicitly state that and we would follow best practices of pointing you to mental health pr uh, professionals or helplines where a human uh, would pick up to really escalate this, this situation appropriately. And to be honest, I, I'm not aware of any such tool that actually has been designed specifically for kind of the highest risk population of people with kind of recent suicidal ideation um, or attempts. At the same time, I think it's important not to forget about those populations as well. So much in, in this research, and, and you mentioned companies with so many products, and we wave our hands and just say, if you're having suicidal thoughts, kind of please call this number, <laughs> kind of this, yeah. this tool is it, not for you. But the helplines are struggling too. I, uh, it, it is so deeply painful to, to hear some of the helplines share that they might have hour long waiting lists, like when, when you call with suicidal thoughts, and you need to talk to a person, um, and AI is not ready to take that call, that people have to wait, maybe for two hours in, in a wait line to talk to anyone. These organizations are also thinking about what could we provide while this person that is at very high risk is waiting currently on the line, they're waiting to talk to somebody, they won't get to talk to anybody for two hours or so. Like, is there anything we could do with this person, possibly with AI tools um, in this situation? Um, I think it's an important kind of uh, question not to forget because this happens to, to a lot of people. And at the same time, I'm not aware of any AI approaches that I, I would be confident in putting in this situation uh, currently really um, and, and responsibly deal with the risk that we've been talking about. Such a good point. Not one I'd considered. I used to work at a the National Suicide uh, Crisis Hotline here in Australia, Lifeline, and you would have a four-hour shift where the phone would be nonstop, 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 and you'd have people literally who had thoughts of suicide, had pills with them or some sort of a weapon who were intending to take their life, who had been waiting for 20, 40 minutes sometimes. Yeah, that is a, a super important consideration, Tim. Yeah. As we kind of come to the end, I'm just looking at the time, Tim, I know you're going to run in a second. What's the next frontier here in AI and mental health? Am I, as a psychologist, going to be replaced? Should I be looking for a, a, another job, another field soon? Or where is this going to go in terms of the research? 
Or like you're, you're talking about the elephant in the room about like, is any of this technology going to replace anyone? I think it's important to talk about this. I'm really not too concerned for the field of, of psychology and, and mental health professionals. We, we started our conversation by talking about all the mental health access issues. So really, the, the person that these AI tools could possibly replace, that person doesn't exist. And that is so often the kind of a, a key problem as well. I think mental health professionals are so direly needed and will continue to be needed. And in fact, they're also needed to develop these type of tools. I don't foresee kind of AI technology kind of replacing any therapist anytime soon. In mm -hmm. fact, all of our work is really focused on this human AI collaboration scenario where there's so many ways short of and, and instead of replacing anyone, we can use these AI tools to help train providers. So we have more of them and that they can provide care at, at higher quality. We've talked about this empathy training tool, which is a, an AI tool to train peer supporters. We rely on so much due to the lack of professionals and we can help train them so they can also provide a higher support that is actually accessible. Uh, we've talked about kind of this co-pilot model where mental health professionals delivering care would be able to get feedback and support either kind of live during a session or, or after the session. And we've also talked about how AI tools can help improve these self-guided interventions that absolutely can, I think, also help augment therapy processes, kind of human therapy processes happening today. If you are sending home your client with a, an, a CBT worksheet to learn how to reframe thoughts, like, this technology, we've actually computed it. We can, somebody can use this tool and it costs between like four and eight cents currently for somebody to use this tool, which is about the cost of actually printing them a sheet of paper. But the difference is that this is a much more interactive experience that tells you what you're doing well, tells you what you're not doing well, helps you along when you're struggling. And a piece of paper is doing none of that. But the, the point really is, I really see AI kind of augment so many of these processes rather than replacing anyone. I expect that this will continue to be the case for a long time. Pleasing to hear. And I'm sure for many psychologists listening, that'll be the same case. And I'm really looking forward to, yeah, the, the research and the innovations that are going to happen in this field because it can, it has the potential to be a real game changer in my humble opinion and to really impact thousands and millions of lives across the world. It'd be interesting to have this conversation in five to 10 years time, see where the research is at and, and see whether I still have a job as well. <laughs> yeah, let's make uh, sure, sure to, to reconnect at that time. I, I'd, be, I'd, I'd be willing to take a bet on you. Um, <laughs> but I also appreciate the kind words. We, we, we do see a lot of opportunity here. All the risks and uh, kind of societal implications we've discussed are real, are important to be discussed. I, I think there's lots of danger with this work being done without the required responsibility. If we're talking about psychologists and whether psychologists are being replaced, I, I think it's really the opposite. We, we need so many uh, psychologists that can also share their psychology expertise, inform the design of all of these systems. And, and in fact, all of the tools that I've presented really were co-developed with clinical psychologists, mental health advocates, the, the clients, patients, or, or kind of MHA visitors themselves, I really see a lot more opportunity to, to work together to solve these systems rather than being displaced by, by anyone. A promising future, definitely, Tim. And I want to yeah, thank you for all your research today. Like I said, it really has changed my view of AI and mental health. Uh, it's certainly a promising landscape, and it sounds like you're already changing lives meaningfully. So thank you for your work you've done and for sharing all your wisdom on the podcast today. Thank you for the kind words and for having me on this podcast.